Communication about freedom. We live in a fascinating age. As a matter of fact, I can't think of a time in history where so many factors have risen to the surface that demand our attention and our intelligence as we seek to deal with them. This is an age that has so much going on that its fascination almost bridges on fear. There are so many things going on, and we are often not prepared to deal with them, and so we look around us with apprehension, wondering if we are really going to be able to face up to the opportunities and the problems that we have. This is an age where the concept of authority is being challenged. It is an age where two opposing forces that have been opposed throughout much of history are facing each other for a real serious confrontation. These two forces could be called the forces of liberty and the forces of tyranny. But I'm going to refer to the forces in a more uh, in, in a more gentle vein, and I'm going to call them the forces of libertarianism and the voices and forces of authoritarianism. And these two general ideas are now coming into confrontation. What is important right now is that we learn how to communicate precisely what we do mean in these areas. Communication about liberty is, I believe, one of the most basic items today. Now, fortunately, we human beings have a lot going for us. You know, really, people are wonderful. They really are. We want things and we have a great deal of ability to get the things that we want. But one of the things that we do have is an ability to communicate to others ideas that we have in our minds. Now, we are the only species, so far as we know, that has the ability of communicating with really great precision. We presume here that many other species are able to communicate primarily at an emotional level, to let others of their kind uh, know that they fear something or that they are happy about something, an emotional type of communication we can detect in the lives and behavior of a number of other living species. But when it comes to man, we can communicate, and uh, we spend a lot of time doing it, trying to communicate with great precision various technical and various refined ideas that are of e enormous meaning to us. So the art of communicating is an important one, and it is particularly important as we begin dealing in abstract thought, which would relate, of course, to such things as libertarianism, authoritarianism, and so on. First of all, how do we communicate? Well, there are a number of ways that we, uh, that we communicate. Uh, one, one of the most common, is by means of the spoken word, the voice. Uh, we vocalize, we verbalize, we, we put into agreed upon sounds uh, w uh, meanings that we intend to convey to another mind. And we should keep in, uh, in focus constantly that the important thing about communication is not the word that we use, but the fact that understanding ensues. So many times people are, uh, they, they create a, a problem for themselves because they get, you could say, hung up on their own words. They, they don't really, uh, they don't really get to the meaning. They, they become, uh, word bound. And then they limit their communication by insisting on the use of certain words. There's no particular word that is sacred. There is no particular series of words that has to be followed. If we are going to communicate intelligently, it is the transference 
of images that we're really after. The transference of an idea into the mind of another party, never mind what words you use. The word is the servant to the idea, not the other way around. Of course, this business of verbalizing is only one of the methods that we have of letting other people know precisely what meaning we intend them to understand. Another method is writing. We take these same verbal sounds and we have developed a system of symbols to accompany the sounds, and by stipulation, we have agreed that certain sounds relate to certain symbols, and then we put it down on paper and we can communicate that way. And this is a very good way of communicating, too. It takes a little more effort, usually. Most of us will tend to verbalize a lot more than we uh, inscribe. We are, are not uh, <laughs> quite as uh, as willing to take the time to write as we are to vocalize. In fact, possibly um, most of us vocalize a little too much, <laughs> which uh, uh, I suppose is one of my cardinal sins. Anyway, uh, that's another way we have of communicating, writing. Another is by uh, drawing pictures, sketching, uh, a drawing, uh, artwork of various sorts. In fact, all artwork, in a sense, is a type of communication, from sculpturing to dancing, uh, music. All of these things are, are methods of communicating an idea or an emotion or something of this sort. We use color this way. Uh, I might point out that even the posture of the person communicates uh, his gestures, his facial expressions, the type of clothing that he wears, the manner in which he comports himself, uh, where he dines, whom he is seen with, all of these things tell a story. You and I are constantly engaged in the business of trying to let other people know who we are and what we mean to ourselves and hopefully what we mean to other people and to things. Communication is a tremendously vital activity of uh, the human being. Actually, we probably haven't done as much work in this area of understanding just the primacy of uh, communication as much as we should have done. Uh, I would contend, for instance, that there are three basic human drives. There is the uh, what we could call biologic necessity, and there would also be economic necessity, and I would contend that communication necessity is equally uh, vital and equally important. Man, by his nature, has a basic drive uh, biologically, he has a basic drive uh, economically, and he has a basic drive communicatively. Uh, I don't think we've tended to put those three things at the same level, and I think we should. Because communication is so important, it becomes a, a primary objective to learn how to do it well. And there are some extremely important rules. Fortunately, they are also quite simple. So we can learn to be good communicators, to let other people know what it is that we mean. Now, one of the first things to understand about good communication is that communication is always a two-way street. Uh, just like hooking up an electric circuit, one wire won't do the job. You have to have a flow of current going both ways. And take, for instance, verbal communication. When you are going to verbalize an idea, the, one of the most important things you can do is to begin by getting the attention of somebody, the party you want to communicate to. Now, you do this in any number of ways, but one of the best, and quite frankly, one of the easiest, is to begin by looking at that party. Look at them intently, and don't let your eyes or your attention waver. Now, this is one of the surest ways of getting their attention in return, and in a sense, by doing this, you have plugged in to their mind, and now you're in a position where you can convey thought. Now, if your mind wanders and your eyes wander and so on, well, you can be pretty sure that your recipient of ideas is going to wander also. 
So one of the best things is to get this attention. And uh, uh, sometimes, for instance, um, uh, people teaching speech have pointed out that uh, if you're going to make a good speech, you want to begin with a crash opening because it's calculated to get attention. And, of course, this is what you... you uh, if you're talking to a, a small group of people... One of the best attention getters that you have is to focus on one person. Don't try to take in everybody. Focus on one. I might even suggest that this is a good plan if you're addressing a large group and have a, a, a um, numerous audience in front of you. It is still a good idea to focus on one person and be sure that you're in rapport, that you are hooked in with his brain waves, as it were, and then uh, it is going to seem to the others that you're talking to them too on a person-to-person -person basis. It's a very important thing. Get the attention. All good communication is really a one-to-one -one affair. It's one mind to one mind. Uh, if you put something in writing, it's one mind to one mind. If you... If you uh, create a picture or a work of art, you are really expressing yourself, but hopefully it will be picked up by another mind that will get what it is you are trying to say. Now, in order to facilitate good communication, there are certain uh, lines that you should not cross over. Uh, in fact, I, I could divide uh, uh, this area of communication into three spectrum, so to speak, or three, three avenues, there would be the uh, frigid zone, the temperate zone, and the torrid zone. And good communication occurs at the temperate zone. Now, what I mean is this. The tor the, uh, I'll take the frigid zone first. The frigid zone occurs when you begin trying to communicate with someone and uh, you hit upon a subject that they're not interested in, or you do it in such a way that you tend to ignore their importance, you begin to uh, praise yourself, you are so egocentric that you fail to notice that they also are egocentric, and the consequence is that you just uh, sort of uh, lord it over them, you, uh, you become a braggart, or you, you talk too loudly, you don't make it a, an easy thing for them to tune in with you, and when you do this, you begin to bore people. And that creates a dropping in temperature, and you're moving into the frigid zone. When people are bored, their attention is going to go someplace else. They're going to begin looking at their watches. They're going to begin yawning. They're going to begin looking for some way to escape from you. And that's not a good way to begin and to continue a good communication avenue. Now, the other area that you want to avoid is the torrid zone. And what happens here is that uh, you may start using words or you may get into an area of communication that although it may be vital to you, you, you may be doing it in such a way that you tend to antagonize the other person. You have reached what we could call his hot button. Uh, he's getting angry. And the minute a person begins to get angry as a result of your communication efforts, uh, he's not interested in hearing anything more that you've got to say. He's interested in saying something back to you. In fact, he wants to take you on now. He doesn't want to communicate with you. He probably wants to hit you. <laughs> and and so the, the room is heating up. You're in a torrid area, and communication of ideas is, is being narrowed right down to a, a motivational factor where he's either going to want to get away from you or he's going to want to hit you or do something to you. He's no longer getting the message. He wants to give a message and his message is going to be unpleasant. Well, these are areas you want to avoid. Good communication avoids both the torrid and the frigid zone. You move into the temperate area. And by doing this, you, you practice good manners you realize that you're talking to another human being who probably knows more than you do in many areas, is just as sensitive as you are, and has got as many things to say as you have, and perhaps could even say them better than you're saying them. Now, when you get that attitude, and then get their attention, 
and operate gently within an area that avoids the extreme pressure of excessive heat or excessive chill, you can get a two-way communication going, and it becomes a great joy. There's an unfolding that occurs uh, between both communicants. It's one of the most vital and deeply meaningful things that we can do is to enter into a real exchange with another party who is being assisted by you to that same type of exchange. I, I recall an instance, it's quite vivid from my early uh, childhood. Well, I wasn't really a child. I was about 15, I recall at the time. And uh, my mother had a friend, uh, an older woman, to me, a vastly older woman. She was probably in her 40s, but uh, <laughs> uh, to me, she was uh, very elderly. And uh, she used to come to visit us on occasion and uh, spend the night. And uh, she lived in a, a, quite away from our home, and the trip was so long that she couldn't uh, just come and go in one day back in those days, so she had to come to stay overnight. And I, I remember I always looked forward with great eagerness to her coming because this girl, I call her a girl now, she's just a youngster, uh, anyway, <laughs> she had a facility for communication that was beautiful. What she did... The minute anybody showed up and, uh, and, and wanted to talk to her, she immediately dropped everything else and focused on you with her mouth slightly open and her eyes sparkling, looking right at you as though what you had to say was at least on the level of holy writ. I mean, nothing could have been more important than what I wanted to say to her when she showed up, at least she conveyed that impression. I thought she was great. So did everybody in the family. We all thought that she took a special interest in each one of us personally. Now that I look back at it, I'm not sure she took any special interest in any of us. But she was good at communicating. And as I look back, I don't think she ever lectured me at any time. Almost everybody else did, but I don't think she ever did. At least I can't remember it. And yet I can remember learning things from her. So she must have had a very subtle way of making the exchange a two-way street that always built me up. And I loved it. She made me important. She was at once sympathetic, eager. Uh, there was a ready smile, a, 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 uh, an eagerness, a willingness to laugh, to be amused, and yet uh, also... A, a, a deep feeling of sympathy and rapport so that you felt she understood. Oh, this gal was great as a communicator. And you know, I speak of her because thinking back, I've only found two or three more in my lifetime that were as good as that. And fundamentally, it was this ability of tying in on an attention wavelength, keeping out of the frigid and the torrid zones, and then just opening up and being a free recipient of ideas uh, uh, and bouncing them back, as I'm sure she did. And uh, th this was a very rewarding experience. It's something we can do and should do. This becomes particularly important when we're talking in terms of abstractions such as liberty and authority. These are very, very meaningful abstractions. And I don't think we take enough time when we're in school learning about abstractions. Uh, we, um, we tend to, to uh, take up English, of course. We spend a lot of time learning English, and we learn the parts of speech, including nouns and verbs and adverbs and adjectives and so on. But when we get to nouns, there are several types of nouns, but there is the type of noun called an abstract noun, a word that relates not to something that exists in reality, not to a concrete or proper thing, but to a concept, to an idea. And when we're communicating at the level of abstracts, it's very difficult to convey precise meanings because we don't have the uh, agreement in advance from the other party as to just what we mean in this area. Now, if I want to communicate with you as to what a table is, and you've never heard that word before, I have a very simple expedient so that we both understand each other right away. I take you by the hand, as it were, and I take you and show you a table. And I say, there, now that's a table, 
And characteristic with all tables, there's a top on it that you can use for various things. It has to be sort of a flat top. That's characteristic of all tables. You've got a thousand different types of tables, and they're used in a thousand different ways. But characteristically, here is what they are. And you can see it, you can feel it, you can touch it, and by this process you know what a table is. So then when I use the word, and you know that this is what I mean, we come to an immediate understanding. But what do I mean when I'm talking about freedom? How do we understand that? Or how do we understand the other abstract terms that we use? There is a way of dealing with abstractions that we ought to focus on for a moment. It is a method of setting up a scale of comparison. We learn what we're talking about at the abstract level in part by learning how to exclude the things that we're not talking about. In the abstract level, we actually have a four-part uh, scale, uh, a four-point scale, that tells us uh, about the area we want to get into. What we seek is things that are identical, things that are similar, things that are different or dissimilar, and things that are opposite. Let me give you a quick illustration of what I mean here. Uh, let's take the word hot. Now, what does that mean? Well, we all have a general idea of what it means. Hot is a temperature condition uh, that relates to an increase of heat over and above some other amount of heat. <laughs> There's nothing very precise about it. Uh, something is hot compared to something else that isn't quite as hot. That's about all we've got to go on there. The word is very indefinite. And yet we use the word all the time, and in general we know what it means. Uh, what it means. Now, if, I, if you had never heard that word before, how would I let you know what hot is? Well, I couldn't say, well, hot is just like hot, because that would be comparing it with something that is so much like itself that it's meaningless. So I say, well, hot is like hot. I've said nothing. Well, I could help you a little bit if I said, well, hot is uh, a little more hot than warm. Now we've got a little bit of a basis of comparison. You get the idea that warm has heat in it, but hot has more heat than warm. So you now know that hot is hotter than warm. You've got a little bit of a comparison. But I could do even better if I said to you, well, hot is, has a great deal more heat than cool. Well, yeah, now we're beginning to get, uh, uh, get a little broader base of, of comparison. And suppose I said, well, hot is the opposite of cold. Now we've arrived at the point we want to arrive at. You see what we've used here are four words, each word relating to a different point on our comparative scale. Two hots are identities. Hot and warm are similarities. Hot and cool are differences or dissimilarities. Cool is going down the scale. Warm and hot are both going up. Uh, warm is warmer than normal. Hot is quite a bit warmer than normal. Cool is below normal. But now I say cold. And that is a mutually exclusive term. When I'm talking in terms of what is cold, I have excluded hot. If I'm talking in terms of what is hot, I have exclu excluded cold. And that's what we try to do when we communicate in abstractions. We try to find what it is we're talking about by identifying what it is we're not talking about. And then we exclude all of the gray area in between, the excluded middle, anything that might confuse us. So that makes it as precise as we can make it. You see, when I'm talking about a table, getting back to a concrete noun, the minute we identify the table as what it is, that's an extreme identification. Once a table is known to be a table, we automatically exclude everything else that it isn't. Uh, we know that a table is not a bed, a lamp, a horse, a banana. It's, it's a table. There, there, there's no argument about it. You don't compare it with anything. In fact, with, with proper nouns, you don't try to exclude anything. You, you don't say, well, to understand what a table is, you have to understand what a table isn't. You don't do that. What's the opposite of a table? There isn't any opposite to a table, or there are many opposites to a table, any way you want to look at it. 
uh, th 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 we don't think that way. But at the abstract level, we think in terms of opposites because that helps us polarize our thinking so we know exactly what we mean. Now, this is very important when we're thinking in terms of human liberty because liberty would be the opposite of that which is not libertarian. <laughs> and what, pray tell, is that? Well, when we're dealing in this area, it would be important to realize that the word liberty or the word freedom tends to polarize in two directions, and that's the reason so many people are confused about it. If it only polarized in one direction, we probably wouldn't have the difficulties with it that we do. But today I find, for instance, many people are afraid of freedom, and many people pro uh, tell me that they don't fear it at all, they love it, and yet I have a sensation that they're talking about two different things. You see, if I'm thinking about my freedom, I love freedom because it's a part of my nature to be free. I want to make up my own mind. I want to think my own thoughts, make my own decisions, and act on the basis of things that I know are meaningful and constructive and creative for me. So freedom to me is on the plus side. It's a great thing. But now what about freedom for you? Well, I'm not so sure about that. What would you do with your freedom? I know what I'm going to do. I'm a high-type fellow. You know, I wouldn't hurt anybody. But what about you? I don't know what you do. And so when I begin thinking about freedom for you, I'm not quite so certain that it's a desirable good. Now, this is what I run into when I talk with other people. And I use the word freedom or liberty. It depends on where they're focusing. If they're focusing on themselves, they light up and they say, boy, that's great. Freedom is a great thing. But if they're focusing on other people that they're afraid of, then their mouths drop and they look very concerned and they say, well, I, don't, I, I think you can overdo this freedom. Uh, and, but they're not thinking about themselves here. They're thinking about other people. And how are they going to uh, prevent other people from taking advantage of them? So here you have a word that is used indiscriminately to mean opposite things. I, I think perhaps uh, uh, Lincoln at one time uh, said this about as well as it's been said. Uh, I don't have his quotation in front of me here, but I can paraphrase it uh, quite accurately, I believe. He said at one time, the world is very much in need of a good definition for liberty. With some, it seems to mean the right of a man to do as he pleases with himself and the products of his labor. And with other men, it seems to mean the right of a man to do as he pleases with other men and the products of other men's labor. Now, these are both called freedom. But in point of fact, they are opposites, and therefore they must be known by opposite names. And if the one is freedom, the other must be tyranny. I would have to agree with Mr. Lincoln on that point. We are going to have to learn to recognize the difference between freedom, which is essentially self-authority, the authority of the person over himself and what is his, and non-freedom, which is authoritarian, and the authority of the other party over a person that is not him and over the property of the other party. This is the area we're going to have to learn to communicate in. It's an extremely vital area, and that's what we want to concentrate on. Thanks very much.